Good morning and hello there YouTube. Devin here again and before I head off to work and to go watch my kitty cat for the next like six months, stuff like that, um, as most of you know, something I just have to do today, but we're going to be doing a video on what is easily the heaviest helmet I own. Um, now this helmet weighs over two kilograms, uh, for those Americans out there, do it yourself. Uh, metrics better. Uh, so what we have here is an SSH-68N, um, which is the heavier of the two uh, SSH-68 uh, hybrid helmets. Um, there would be the M and the N. Uh, this is the later one, and it is heavier than the M version. It also received a new liner. So, the reason this thing exists is so after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, the Russian Federation, the new Russian Federation, uh, inherited the bulk of the Soviet military. You know, obviously the Comblock countries would keep their portions uh, because they're now independent. Um, but, like, so the Russians were way behind in equipment. They realized in the 90s and the 2000s from the Western powers, you know, that were their primary enemies to the, a degree still. Um, so you would see the Russians playing catch-up and trying to update their army in the most economic way possible. Um, so they were issuing steel helmets still. Uh, the vast majority of the Soviet military had steel helmets. Um, basically by the fall of the Soviet Union they were f experimenting with the first uh, kind of composite helmets, mostly aramid fibers, which is like what Kevlar is made out of. Um, stuff like that. Um, and in the mid-2000s, they decided that this would be a good uh, stopgap, uh, so they would ditch the smallest uh, SSH-68 shell, this the steel helmet, um, they would grind the rivets off, it would now take uh, split head screws and stuff like that, and they would put this uh, aramid uh, liner in them, this kind of ballistic uh, liner, it was called a material called VSM, which is a, an aramid type material. Um, so they would put this big kind of Kevlar uh, into the steel helmet itself. And uh, so they would only use the two largest sizes because now that you're taking up all that space inside the helmet, it obviously makes it smaller on the inside. Um, so they would ditch the smallest size and they would only use the largest sizes um, to make uh, the 68 M's and N's. Now, God, that thing's heavy. Um, the SSH-68M would be adopted by the military for the most part. Um, it would be given to uh, a lot of like vehicle drivers and stuff like that. It, it's a Russian uh, protection rating of 1, uh, which means it's rated for a lot of kind of smaller, lower velocity revolver rounds and the 9 by um, 18 Makarov. It's... That's basically what the SSH-68 is kind of designed to stop kind of smaller, slower moving bits of shrapnel and stuff like that. It's still not really designed to protect from bullets, um, but that's kind of its protection rating system because bullets are a lot more easier to control than sporadic shrapnel. <coughs> Excuse me. So they would eventually decide that, you know, putting, uh, putting a Kevlar liner into, well, Kevlar, a VSM aramid liner into the SSH-68 would provide kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and it, it does, from what I understand. This helmet's actually still in use to a degree um, by a lot of troops. They would come out kind of in the mid-2000s um, and be used for, for quite a long time. Um, but it would provide the best of both worlds. The deflection capabilities of steel, but the deformation patterns and shock absorption of aramid. Um, I don't think it's actually been used in a conflict to the point where, like, we see soldiers wearing these taking blows to the head because they were kind of issued to rear, rear line troops um the troops uh frontline troops would be getting you know 6b7s and 6b71ms and later 6b47s and these would kind of be pushed further and further and further back um but the 6b i mean sorry this the ssh 68m would be just the same thing as an ssh 68 um now with a obviously vsm air midliner put into it it would retain the same pads and like suspension system as the SSH 68 and the same chin strap. Um, it would just basically look up from the outside like an SSH 68, but much heavier. 
Um, and then the SSH-68N would come out a few years later, um, where they would increase the thickness of the Airman liner, and they would put a modern uh, kind of suspension and um, chin strap harness in it, uh, which is something that desperately needed to be done, um, because the SSH-68, uh, uh, with that much weight, it was fine when it was kind of a lighter weight steel helmet, but when you put that that air mid liner and it really increases the weight and the way that the suspension is set up in the SSH 68 in that single you know two point chin strap it made the helmet very kind of awkward and it tended to shift around on the head a lot um, which is a bit of a problem if you've ever had to wear a helmet um, especially if you're trying to fight or do any tasks where you you need to be you know have movement and sight and hearing and stuff like that um, something that wants to shift that easily on your head is kind of a problem um, as a lot of people know. So that's why they came out with the SSH-68N and just to bring up the protection rating a little bit more, but at the cost of weight, like I said, this helmet weighs over two kilograms. It's incredibly heavy, um, which is absurd. This is a very, very heavy helmet. Um, the heaviest one I own, actually, I don't know the exact weight on it because I don't have a scale that it would be like accurate enough to do that, um, that can do that much weight. So. Uh, eventually something, you know, if, the, if you want to kick a little bit money towards the Patreon or something, or make a donation to the PayPal that, and tell me what you want me to use it for, like on a better digital scale, that'd be something cool to do for videos. So if you, if you feel like that's something you want to do to support the channel, I'm all for it. But, uh, so now we're going to flip this, uh, camera around, take a look at the liner of this helmet, um, because it is kind of interesting. I don't have an SSH 68 to compare it to, unfortunately not anymore. Um, that was one of the things I had to go to make room for more helmets. I actually have a couple for sale still, four right now, if anyone is interested. Um, tune into one of the live streams and ask about them, and I can pull it right up on camera for you, and we could work out a deal right there. So, we'll flip the camera around now, take a look at the liner, and see how it is and stuff like that, how it looks, how it kind of varies for most of you that have seen an SSH-68 liner. Most of you have, I assume. Um... It's a very, very common helmet out there nowadays. And then we will flip the camera back around after taking a look at the liner and the suspension and stuff like that. And we're going to put it on, show you it from different angles, see how it fits, how it feels, uh, the strain on the neck, uh, where, you know, parts are, how the liner and chin strap fit and feel on somebody actually. And then we'll show you it from different angles, simulate going prone to see if the helmet bites into the back of your neck or anything like that. And then we will conclude the video. So, stay tuned as we flip around and take a look at the liner. Alrighty, so here we are looking at the liner of the SSH-68N. Um, as you can see, it's kind of a, a modern nylon-esque thing, lots of plastic and stuff. The chin strap is kind of like a seat belt buckle where you would push this little tab forward on the red part here and then simultaneously pull the buckle up. It's a little kind of uh, powder-coated metal buckle. The chin cup is leather. As you see here, it's a pretty wide, spacious chin cup. Um, it is adjustable via Velcro tabs and one kind of uh, elastic keeper here, um, which uh, works out great if uh, your head is uh, small enough to where this tail sticks out too far. For me, it's just this kind of just a useless piece of elastic because um, my head's big enough for that. Um, but you could still see that this, this helmet liner works on the same principle as the SSH 68 as it has this whole liner is still on these arms that you could see these big kind of steel arms that stick down from the crown of the helmet towards the rim but it's not actually directly like riveted to the uh, shell itself down here and what that means is that this liner has a lot of room to flex and move inside this helmet in an impact um, to dissipate some of that uh, force rather than transferring it into your head because you have these little kind of spring arms that the whole the whole suspension is running on and as you can see these have a lot of movement in them these spring arms um, and that's going to keep your your head a lot safer in an impact rather than you know transferring it all right into your head uh, as with more helmets where the pads are are and the liner system is riveted down near the the rim of the shell rather than up by the crown um, so that was a huge upgrade the Russians came out with in the 60s with the SSH-60. Um, so as you see, we have a nice foam-thick crown pad. It is adjustable at the top uh, via a little 
You probably can't really see it in there, but there's a drawstring that you can tie um, to increase the depth of this crown pad, whether it you know sits closer to the crown of the helmet or farther away from it. Um, your chin strap is adjustable, obviously via here on the chin cup, and then here along the the back strap of the chin strap. It is a three-point chin strap where you can see the the screws for the chin strap. There's one here on each side, and then there's one here in the rear. The chin strap is is in place way down near the rim of the shell, but that's not as important as the actual liner. The chin strap's just a way of basically holding the helmet on your head, um, and a lot of the force isn't going to be transferred um, in an impact through the chin strap. It's going to come through the, the liner. So, because if you're getting hit down by where the chin strap is, it's probably just going to go through your face or your neck or something like that anyways, and you're dead anyways. So, but this is what the liner looks like. It's a big kind of complicated esque liner it looks like but it's actually a lot simpler than most people would seem to to think um so it's a it's a pretty neat design um i think it's actually relatively comfortable for what it is this is a major upgrade especially with this much weight compared to the ssh 68 and the ssh 68 m um so but now we're gonna go put this helmet on flip the camera around uh, all the other good stuff i'm gonna put the cover back on it and things uh it does take the same covers as the ssh 68 any cover that fits the ssh 68 in the larger sizes will fit on this helmet if you are interested in getting one uh just so you know it's a it's a pretty effective helmet in the fact that you know it's steel and aramid so uh We'll flip the camera back around now, put this thing on, hopefully not break my neck because it weighs so much, and then we'll uh, take a look at it from a couple different angles. Alrighty, let's throw this beast on now that I got the cover back on it and everything, and uh, we're going to see how it fits and how it feels. Alright, so as you can see, it's a, it's a fairly large helmet. Um, it is already incredibly heavy on the head. Um, uh, all right, so it's actually not too bad as far as the like liner comfort goes. Um, it is incredibly heavy. Uh, this helmet is very, very heavy. Um, you, you feel a lot of force coming like straight down. So that crown pad is being really driven into the top of my head because of just the sheer weight of this helmet. Um, the chin cup is, you know, comfortable. The chin strap is comfortable. Um, it's it's a relatively nice chin strap. It does feel like only like a two point because the the third point is is connected to the chin strap so high up. It's actually like connected right here near the rim of the the, the helmet. Um, I don't know if you can see it. There's the support strap for it right there. So um, it's it's so it, it it doesn't block my hearing. As you can see, the fingers can go you know into the ears. Uh, stuff like that. It it works out quite well. Um, it doesn't block my hearing. Um, it does tend to block my vision a little bit more because this helmet obviously has such an aggressive slope to it. It sticks out so far. Um, so it, it blocks my vision from above quite a lot. But as far as like being able to see with my peripherals and everything, it's still pretty good. Um, this helmet, oh god, it's just, it's so heavy. Um, but, you know, shaking this thing around, it is uh, surprisingly for this weight really really stable um it does move around as you can see just because of the nature of the liner and that's good like i said so your helmet would sit normally like this but an impact see how this helmet this helmet can shift in every direction like a lot because of that liner and that's going to be good at dissipating a lot of that impact um you have to like really want it though you have to be pushing kind of hard to get this you know liner to move um so it's not just something that's going to be you know kind of flopping around everywhere um, it, it, it's, it feels, you know, heavy, but very stable, um, for what it is, but it, it is an ungodly heavy helmet. So, so now we're going to turn around and show you it from different angles, uh, simulate going prone and stuff with it. So this is obviously the front profile of it with its cover. Um, this is the right side profile. Uh, this is the rear profile. And now we're going to, uh, simulate going prone. I'm going to look up as high as I can. Uh, see if there's any, you know, tug and pull on the chin strap, see if the shell touches anywhere along my neck or, you know, upper shoulder region, um, and we'll, we'll see how that works. Okay, so this helmet does touch. I can feel it with my hood. It does, it, it does touch, um, just barely, 
Um, it doesn't really, so if you're wearing kind of colored body armor, which was kind of the body armor of the day and age of this type of helmet, um, it would be getting in the way. And um, so if I just simulate this now by pushing up on the back of the helmet, it, it's very hard to push up to ride in front of my vision because of how the chin strap is. Um, but you can do it. It will ride up in front of your vision. Um, you have to want it to kind of want it, but you know, soldiers are tend to known for being a little bit more harsh with their equipment than normal. Um, it can ride up and block your vision. Um, and then this is the left side profile of the helmet. So, flipping back around here now. Uh, I don't know how this helmet really would have performed. It seems like a really, really good idea on paper, but there really isn't enough data out there. This really hasn't been in enough conflicts to know if it was actually good or not. Um, this is a very, very expensive helmet, and it seems like it would do quite well with protection because you have the benefits of both materials, the steel and the aramid, um, if that's something you're really looking into. It's, it, it seems like it's, it's a good idea and a good design. They, they made a fairly decent amount of these, obviously, two iterations, um, and they're still in use as far as I know with the, you know, Russian military um, and the uh, internal forces. So... Hopefully you like this video and you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. Um, I have still quite a few helmets to show. I'm, more, uh, show. I'm planning on restarting the boot thing and the canteen and mess kit uh, playlist too. If that's something you are looking into, that's going to need a new tripod first though. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, if you're interested in donating the channel, like I said, it goes a long ways to really, really help support the channel. Um, if you can't, you know, just watching the video to its completion, liking, comment, subscribing, sharing, all that other good stuff helps, helps a lot. Um, and it means the world to me. So, because this is, after all, just a hobby to share a bunch of information and uh, cool stuff with you guys. So, thank you so much, and I will hopefully see you all here in the next video. Bye bye now.